Hey, it's from the West Barn with Joe West and, and Mike Shimshack. There he goes. Hey, we want to remind you really quick. Today, our guest is Jeff Copeland. But before we do that, we want to remind you to subscribe wherever you're listening. If you're on YouTube, hit uh, subscribe and notification and hit the little bell so that you're reminded when we have new content. And uh, first and foremost, share everything. Uh, put it on your timeline and just share it with people that you think might be a good fit for our podcast. Without further ado, Jeff Copeland. Yeah. Gentlemen. We are like... We are buds, the three of us. We have some history. 20 years? Uh, let me see, 93? 27 years, dude. I think I met you in 93. Oh my goodness. No, that's not possible. Do you realize you are the reason I know how to engineer in a oh. real studio? I remember Jeff would always <laughs> say to me, so real quick before we get into that, uh, Jeff Copeland is a brilliant songwriter, a brilliant guitar player and record producer. He's one of these guys that's a deadly weapon in all facets. Plays bass, one of my favorite bass players. And he Thank you. Uh, it's one of those things where it's like he doesn't really consider himself that, or at least he didn't. Uh, but he had a number one with a band called, um, don't tell me this, the, the song was called Angel Eyes. Yeah. And it was Love and Theft. Love and Theft, yeah, had a U.S. number one. And uh, you developed that band from nothingness to number one. <laughs> yes. Which is one of the big reasons we wanted to talk to you, other than hearing about you and your life and how it reflects through that. But you've been one of these guys that has consistently, uh, back real early, you were just engineering and producing records, right? And getting in bands, and then those bands would, would become popular. Then you decided... Forget everybody in the band because it's too big of a pain to the butt. This is my assumption. I'm putting words in your mouth. I'm just going to build stuff. I'm going to develop talent and then get them yeah. record deals. And you, you've been, out of all my friends, you've been the most successful at that. Well, so I started off being in a band because I could sing, but I'm definitely not a lead singer. So I always needed somebody to sing the songs. Um, and my first band is why I moved to New York before I met you. Um, was I still in a band when I met you? Yeah, I, yeah you were. I was, it, yeah. Hidden Persuaders. Yeah, nice. And I love that band. That's the, that's the deal with Jeff. Jeff yeah. gets in a band and then yeah. you love the band. Yeah. Right? It's like he's one of those dudes that whatever he's in, you're, it's just like it's a consequence of his vision of music. So I met you and Nir, Nir Z, was our, he was our drummer. Nir was your drummer? Nir was our drummer. Before... That's I. You guys knew each other before I knew you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm. Tr I'm trying to think of if we met you when I was post band or. When, yeah. When I, did no, the, I had mixed yeah. a Hidden Persuader song. Okay. Down in the little room in. Okay. Smash. I remember that. So is that how you met Nair? And then you no I. You must. Have I been. met because you know he's a drummer. He's on yeah. the records, but it's not like you're hanging out with him. I met Nair later. I think probably at one of your parties. Okay. Did Jeff break your balls on the mix? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeff's incapable. I think I can remember us getting mixes back from Tom Lord Algie. You remember this? Was it Tom or Chris? I was very critical of the of the Moffitt's mix he did. I was me like, too. In fairness, yeah, me too. Yeah. It wasn't his best work. No. But we put it up on the console, and Jeff was just like, "This is shit, man." Oh come on, no. that's amazing. It just sounds like it. it there was not a lot of love given to it. It was yeah. like, "Hey, yeah. I got nine forty-five to ten forty-five. Exactly. Let me squeeze this in." Exactly. Uh, um, but to get back to your question, so I started off being in a band, and there's nothing like it to me. It's like a family, and the creative process with these, you know, your partners is. It's, it, I just I loved it. But the breakup of that band with my singer Wayman, um, who I moved to New York with from Montreal, was friggin' devastating. I mean, like yeah. it, it just crushed me. I'm like, I'll never be in a band again. Fuck this. Can't deal with it. Just like mess me up. Meantime, I was working at Smash and then it turned That's it to early. Gallery with you and I was doing these other projects on the side and I was honestly loving not necessarily the book stuff but the stuff that would come through the studio that I, I got my first taste of artist development with other people. Some of the acts yeah. that were in there, you know, they, they really started a relationship with me and we started even writing together and, and developing their music even though they came to the studio, but I got my first taste of doing that with other people and doing all different kinds of music. And uh, I felt like that's where I needed to be creatively. So um, leaving the band, although it was you know, heartbreaking, opened this whole other musical world uh, to yeah. me. And then, Which you're well suited for. Yeah, like, I mean, I was always very diverse musically. You know, I grew up in all different kinds of music and played different instruments. So the band was... Although it became my thing and morphed into this really dark, you know, this was early 90s and we started in the late 80s. We were 
um, Wayman and I were kind of like a Hall and Oates-ish, popish kind of thing. And, uh, and then as he got more depressed and we all got more depressed, <laughs> living in New York and the brutality of the music business, it, the music got darker, Nirvana hit, and it influenced everybody to change directions. We became and that this, you know, band became Splendor. That band became Splendor. Which had a number yeah. one, was it? No, they didn't, they didn't have a number one, but they were, um, they had a hit called... It's all right, I'm okay, I think yeah. I can explain. Yeah, whatever I think it's it was called. Right, and then, uh, but Wayman okay. wrote this killer song called uh, I Think God Can Explain. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was great. Uh, it was one of those, yeah. like, Vertical Horizon had a tune yeah. that was very yeah. reminiscent, where it was like, it was an earwig. When you got it, it was a big, big song. So we split up, and then I started doing these other things, and then... Um, I think I met you, right? What really got me into artist development was the Berman Brothers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I met you... The Berman Brothers are a giant yeah. conglomeration of two dudes <laughs> that make... Uh, the, they make dance music and EDM music. Uh, and I don't know why Jeff and I were involved. Uh, Jeff and I, I know why. Because it was something that was successful and had a lot of money. And we were like, any, any port in a storm. It wasn't where either of our hearts were. So the... Definitely not. But it's interesting because I follow following your gut and following the opportunities that are right in front of you. That was a huge thing for me because that led me, even That's though it was point. totally not the style of music that I wanted to do. Um, but it got me into songwriting, pop music, which at the you know coming off of uh, the band to be Splendor, was totally different. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the Berman Brothers were came in from Germany. They had a lot of success there. Um, doing Euro dance music. Amber, and, this and is your night. Amber, this is your night. It's uh, one of the real McCoy. Uh, um, Bob, day, the, the Hot 100 version for Um Bob. For well, that was just a remix they did, but... It, well, well, that was a massive... Yeah. That, that was, it, from my understanding, that's what took that song, Hot FM, or the Z100 in New York, which Maybe. was a, a was, major was breakthrough dance for, remix, that, for that they single. They so these guys came and booked Gallery for like a month, okay? Uh, Gallery was a studio that um, Clay Chef, the owner of Smash, uh, built to basically Smash house... Smash was a rehearsal room that had about six or seven rehearsal rooms and a dumpy little studio at the end. Correct. <laughs> okay. But, but that dumpy studio had this awesome Trident 90 that I made all my early stuff on. I yeah. love that board. So Clay, as you know, built Gallery. So Joe and I are both engineers at Smash Studios. And interesting story how I got into... It. I'll sidebar for a second. So I got the job, I don't know if you know this, I got the job at Smash completely bullshitting that I had been an engineer before. So I, <laughs> I, had, moved, I had moved from Montreal and I worked for a s- company called Steve's Music. It was sort of like a Sam Ash. Mm. And they had a rental department and I worked in the rental department. And they had some recording gear. They had a little Fostex, eight track, quarter inch. Probably half inch. Or and they had like a, what was first... Um, Gosh, what was that? It was on an Atari that you would program. It was, became Performer. I think it was called. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah it, they used it in Europe a ton. It was like the main. It's not a Commodore, right? It wasn't a no, Commodore. It was on the actual Atari. It, it was on an Atari computer. Mm. And, if you went to Europe in the 90s, yeah. everybody was using it. It was just, yeah, it was just for programming. And the, the, the rental rule was you had to be, you know, 48 hours in advance, you would have this gear. You were allowed to then take it home. Nobody ever rented the recording gear. So I convinced. The boss is like, can I just keep this stuff at home in my parents' basement? And then if anybody ever calls for it, I'll, you know, I'll bring it back. So I learned how to engineer w- with my band, with, uh, you know, when Wayman and I were just out of just high school. Just by moving mics by, and figuring by it out. just figuring it out in my parents' basement. And I did some live sound with them. I did some, you know, uh, when you go out and do these remote record, you know, not yeah. recordings, but remote uh, live things, they would hire us and I would go. And I, so I knew how to sort of mic a band up live but and then I figured out in my parents basement made these little uh, demos and uh, that's what I brought to New York City with me when we moved there went into Clay who was the owner of Smash and you know hey I need a job I think I rehearsed there saw the studio and was like what by the I, way one of the most yeah. genius moves ever get every rock band in New York to rehearse at your place and then just put a dumpy studio at the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, this but, is the yeah, secret yeah. of working in the music business. But it, he had a great system there. He had a great thing there. Yeah. Um, and I love Clay. And he gave me a shot. You know, he liked me and I played him these recordings and I was like, hey, dude, you need an engineer. You know, this was done at, 
I didn't say Le Studio in Montreal, which is like the big one, yeah. <laughs> but I said some something. This was done on 24 track. I worked there for a few months and I made these recordings. Well, it's done in your. Like, it was done in my parents' shift. basement on a Fostex 8 track. Yeah. But, and he listened to it and he's like, oh, this is great. You're hired. You got a session two days. Can you do this at eight o'clock? And I was like, sure. I'd never seen a two inch machine in my life. <laughs> I had never done anything remotely like this. And I don't remember what the first session was, but he introduced me to you. And he's like, this is Joe. Joe's been my engineer. And I was like, dude, what do I, what do, I do? And you taught me how to align a deck, how to demagnetize the heads <laughs> in like 15 minutes. You know how Joe is. He's very like quick, you know, just yeah. you do this and do this. And you put this kilohertz on and you blah, 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 blah. And I'm like <laughs> trying to take notes, shit. And I was like, okay, buddy, like no follow up. Just gave me that. It's good luck. Pat me on the back. <laughs> Call me if you need me. <laughs> Dude, that's so funny because I can remember Jeff saying, well, you're the, you know, you, you went to school for this. And I was like, yeah. should I tell him that I didn't go to school for this? <laughs> and it was just like, yeah. I kind of quasi, yeah. there's that saying, it's like, hey, don't act like, you know, don't, the last thing you want somebody uh, saying on the job site, whenever you say, hey, who's in charge? You don't want them to say, oh, I thought you were. Right? Yeah. So it's like I just sort of walked around as if I knew, and I didn't know how to do all that stuff, but oh, you. it was interesting because I never went to school for it either. But, interesting. Okay. Uh, but we, Iron ironically, by the way, like I got, I worked for Jeff tuning vocals. Yeah. Uh, he's like, do you know how to tune vocals? I'm like, of course I know how to tune vocals. <laughs> I never tuned a fucking vocal go. in my life. That's it. Man. Fake it till you make Fake it, baby. Till you make it. <laughs> but does that still work today? Yeah. Does it still work? I mean, you talk about how well, you now got what, some Well, now what's different now is that anything you want to do is available on YouTube to learn how to do. Yes. That's that was not true. the case Knowledge the was very valuable. Yeah. Finding a person who knew was like, holy crap, I'm no. not going to tell anybody about you this You can guy. find, if any question you have is available online, the but answer's you, online. You hear these stories about like how maybe some famous engineers got their starts and it was like very haphazard, like they were the only one there and they had this right. thing or like you with the gear... Right? It, does it? Do you think that's? I think now you've kind of got to get to a level where your music is banging and people recognizing your music rather than giving you an opportunity. Well, I was always envious of you, Joe, because you didn't you work under Eddie Kramer? I did a session with him. Yeah, you got, you got to see you got to yeah. see him work. That was a very valuable. Yeah, seeing those guys work, all those real high. I had work. never had an opportunity to do that. I remember I, you I actually you this, I actually learned from you because you were when I started to produce for the Bermans. You were my, I would hire you all the time because you've right. got great sounds and you're a great mixer. So I learned watching you. Oh, that's interesting. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> but we um, eventually went into the yeah. situation where the Bermans were running the studio yearly. Yeah. And then we were both kind of on staff for them, which was, I have pictures of you. We would order from a place called La, Chin La Chinita Linda, which was a Cuban Chinese place. <laughs> Those and, plantains. Oh, and we get fried plantains <laughs> and deep, we get the, the two kinds, the the deep fried ones and the regular fried ones. And we'd get and chicken, chicken with rice and, and we'd get a papaya shake. Oh, yeah. And it, when, shake, when you're nice. in a recording studio in New York City for 10 to 14 oh, yeah. hours a day, yeah. the only thing that you have going for you is the papaya shake. Oh. So it was like, we just like count down the minutes until, and I've got this picture of you where you just, <laughs> you're sitting there at like some archaic, looks like you could play Pong on it, computer, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and he's doing this. He's like, this is his look. It's like, Oh, it's just dying. <laughs> and he's, yeah. You can just tell that he's been staring into this radiated monitor for the last three days programming stuff. So this was a time when, I wonder if I was still in the band. Because when I was, the reason why I got the job at the studio, because I, want, I needed a place to rehearse for free. Clay would let me rehearse for free, and he would let me use the studio off hours. Right. So I was doing these 12-hour sessions, and then the band would come in all fresh and ready to go. All right, let's go. Let's record. Let's, and then I'd spend all night... Yeah, you know, after slaving all day and then do it again the next day. Clay had a ton of couch. great gear and it, in yeah. the studio, even though it was I call it dumpy. It was it's New York City, you know. It was just like he had tons of microphones and great outboard gear. Mm. Then he built this SSL room on the floor above that yeah. was really, really incredible. And the Bermans being one of the clients, so I was assigned to them to be like their guy. <clears throat> and um, Next thing you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm writing with them and um, doing all this stuff. And the way that they would develop acts was a friggin' machine. I mean, these guys were, they were all about quality, no, quantity over quality, 100%. Yeah. This is back in the day where you could, you know, you were selling records like crazy. Yeah. So they didn't care about the singles. They just wanted to have songs on albums. And what they would do is, is they would 
throw these groups together. They would hold auditions and they would cast these groups. Yeah. Half because they wanted to make a record, half because they wanted dates, because a lot of times the artists were female. <laughs> right. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then um, they would throw a bunch of songs on these albums and they would pick out maybe like, they'd focus on one or two to be the hits. And they didn't really care where they came from, honestly. And sometimes we cut outside songs. It's when records were selling. It's when records were selling. They just wanted to have... So is the publishing they were after? Or? Is it the what? Was it the publishing they were after? How were, how were they making them? Okay, if you're, you're selling a million to two million albums and you have eight of the ten songs right. on your okay. thing, Six, it's going to sell as much as... Yeah. Yeah. In mechanicals. Yeah, the mechanicals were, were Now, strong. were they getting these acts record deals? And yep. Yes, because they had the success from Europe and they had the big acts. And I guess, you know, uh, The Real McCoy and Amber were acts that they had... You know, it was very commonplace. And if you're a dance producer or a pop producer from Europe, you would just find an artist and you would take them under your wing and get them deals and that's all they would do is develop acts. You know, the whole, this is the era of, uh, of uh, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Lou Pearlman. I mean, these are all... Right, that's how it was done. It was completely in manufactured York. in the pop world. So that's, so I got to witness this firsthand and I got to see how they went about it and um, it wasn't my kind of music but I like the business model. And now I was the one that would try to squeeze the, the quality into the quantity. <laughs> you know, um, we didn't have a lot of time to do stuff. Um, they would even take acts and sort of flip them. Like the Moffats came along, you were talking about Umbop and, and Hanson. So um, Hanson was really big. So they were like, well, well let's find some brothers. And, uh, and they happened to know through Germany, they knew these kids, the Moffats, that were brothers that were in Nashville doing country music. They had a, a pseudo hit here called the uh, Caterpillar Crawl or something like that. And the, I don't know if you knew this. They were a total country act. I didn't even know they were in Nashville at that point. Yeah. I thought they were still uh, in Canada. Yeah, well, they lived in Calgary, but they, were, they had done some music in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And then they somehow got a deal through Germany. And they, they were like, uh, Hanson's big. Let's, what can, let's make them off. It's a pop act. And the Bermans didn't... So this is how I sort of... You know, wasn't what I wanted to do, Eurodance music. But then they threw these kids that they wanted to be a pop act and they couldn't, that wasn't their thing. So they were like, can you do this? And I was like, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> I'll, give it a, I'll give it a shot. Um, as far as writing goes, I had never really, I wasn't much of a lyricist because uh, I always had Wayman, who was a brilliant lyricist, to write lyrics for me. So I was always just a music guy. And next thing you know, I have to write pop lyrics and... I apologize for some of those really bad. <laughs> well, that that <laughs> so record, that were, <laughs> chapter one, a new beginning. <laughs> yes. How many? How many records did that? That was the five million records or something, right? This is also a time of massive um, bootlegging going on, in especially in Asia. So I think it's a, it, it, it's a officially sold around three three yeah. million, but they estimated and. Four to massive, five times massive that, record. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff is slaving over it. He's programming and writing nonstop. I'm just engineering, so I actually had some time. Uh, it was a normal, busy life for me. And I can remember uh, the bourbons would continually lean into the control room while I was mixing that record. I mixed the entire record in five days and mastered it through two channels on the console. And they kept on saying, it is in my Germany, it does not matter. <laughs> that was their quote. As I was mixing it, it went on to sell three yeah, million copies. They didn't care. They had, they had no idea. They it was had, really no what yeah. you're saying. It's kind it of was, glorious. It was yeah. a conveyor belt. <laughs> I can remember them coming into the control room and them being like, hey, I've got the president of Columbia in the other room. Do you have anything I can play him? Like, <laughs> just like they didn't have anything. To, they'd have presidents meeting with them, wow. trying yeah. to give them a label. And oh, they yeah. wouldn't have yeah. the music yeah. to play them. So like, yeah. what do you have? Anything So did you phone? guys have publishing deals with them? Like when you no. would write a song okay. for them. So I got, this is, I got my first publishing deal because of them. And they connected me with Warner Chapel, who they were signed to. I um, thought you were on Jive. That's after. Oh, okay. That's after. So when I was doing, I'd left the Bermans and then got my own deal with Jive. But well, my first deal was with Warner Chapel that uh, they connected me with. Whether they got a piece of it, I don't really know. Um, I learned a lot from them uh, business-wise. So they had ownership in everything that they did. Yeah. Any act that they had developed and gotten deals for, they had ownership on that. They had complete ownership on me. I mean, I, I took, uh, 
I, I won't say, but I, I took, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I paid my dues. Um, took it somewhere special. Guys. I took it somewhere <laughs> special, but it was my ticket in, and I, and I knew it, and you know, like that's where I great, would. That's a great point. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel looking back, you would do it again? Absolutely. I mean, right. and I would, and I would. I'm really. I'll tell you this interesting. Do you even know how I made the jump to actually writing with them? <laughs> So, you know, when you're an engineer, your job is to get great sounds and do whatever the producer tells you to do. If it's another take, you hit stop, you rewind, you hit record. Is that good? You look up at the producer, the producer says yes. All right? You're not there for your opinion. You're there to deliver the, what the producer wants, right? And producers in general don't like an engineer that's got a mouth. You guys know me. You know I have a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I like to give my opinion, but not in a negative way. Like if, I've, if, I'm, if something's doing something and, I, and I, th I think that there's a better way to do it, it's very hard for me to not suggest, hey, maybe if you did this. So they're in um, on one of our early sessions. And, and this is a, I was at a point where I needed the money to, uh, that the job was giving me, but I was also on the side developing acts and... These were just like straight paid, whoring myself type of uh, sessions and, you know, Euro dance music. They're, the whole session's in German. They're just talking to each other. I don't even understand what's going on. The music's not good. So they had this artist in, okay, that was trying to sing in English. And I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this and uh, the grammar's horrible. The pronunciation of the vowels, terrible. And the guy's just going and they're drilling him. They're drilling him in German. I have no idea what they're saying. All I just know is this is just horrible, and it's like 28 takes, 29 takes, 58 takes, 120 takes. <laughs> and, you know, and they're doing all this stuff, and I'm just, I'm like, I can't take this anymore. I can't, I can't do this. And they were booked for a month. I'm like, I can't do this for a friggin' month. So, I'm, um, and I hadn't known them maybe three days at this point. So, you know them well. So, you can imagine Frank is sitting there and Christian right next to me. And at one point, I said, I got to say something. I'm going to get fired off this thing, but I don't think Clay is going to fire me. He'll understand. But, but I, I, I got to say something because they're actually, they're, I like these guys and hopefully they won't kick me in the balls. So I was like, Frank, um, can I ask you a question, buddy? Uh, do you have plans to release this in the States or is this just for Europe? And if he would have said Europe, I would have been like, okay, whatever, I don't care, fine. No, no one's going to care there. And he goes, no, this is going to be our first act for our U.S. thing that we're, that we're doing. And I was like, sorry, dude, you're probably going to fire me for saying this. And I said really quick, but this really is it's not, this is not good. This is not, never going to fly over here, I'm sorry. And there was like the silence and he looked down at me and he goes, can you fix it? And I was like, Sure. So I was like, do you have the lyrics? And he gave me the lyric sheet. And then I, again, never writing lyrics in my life. I was like, I could definitely at least make it sound like English. So you're taking out the words that were bothering them? Uh, the yeah, thing. I mean, I just did my best to, you know, oh, this should probably rhyme here. And, you know, this makes no sense. And I just took five minutes to rewrite the song. And uh, then we did it, finished, and that was it. Went home, and I was like, okay, I'm not fired. I get home, like, 10 minutes later, the phone rings, and they're like, tomorrow, you want to come right with us? Oh, and, wow. And uh, I was, that was a horrible German accent, by the way. Yeah. And That's cool, though. I was like, sure. That's and, cool. Uh, and then I got into their writing camp. There's so and, much yeah. that people think. If you live in Topeka, Kansas, and you want yeah. to make it and go to a, a big market, you think it's going to be this massive going into town and proving that you're a superstar. But so much of it is is that, which is like, hey, I know English well, <laughs> and I can rhyme words, yeah. you know, it's like, I can do, I can do the utility stuff that scales to a problem that you have. Yeah, I, it's, at the time, I mean, I don't think I was thinking, well, if I'm brave, I'll get, you know, and actually say something, it's going to turn to this, I just honestly just was, couldn't I stand couldn't the, the stand idea it the anymore, of, yeah, that's basically what it was, but in retrospect, um, I could look back and go, well, you know what, that was a really key moment. And it probably would have happened in an, another way. But that was a really clear moment. And then, again, through, the, uh, through their artist development that they were doing um, and having a group like the Moffats sort of change the direction of the type of music that they were doing th with me, you know, that 
became more of a little pop rock thing. And then down to the point where we did that German punk pop group. Uh, score. score. <laughs> the yes. score, score. And you and I went to Ham Hamburg for a month. We spent yeah. a month in Hamburg. And I've been to Berlin. The, but my yeah. favorite memory of that yeah. is that we'd work all day, then the kids would go home. Um, and then, and then th this proves another point. Be careful what you wish for, because then once you do one kid rock band that's successful, you're now the kid rock band guy, <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. And you're yes. gonna be in Venezuela doing yeah. a kid rock band. Well, Jeff and I would work all day, and then the kids would leave, and then Jeff would go replay <laughs> everything. <laughs> Like, not, not Pro Tools, yeah. replay everything. And I would record him, and then they would come in, and I don't know if we were working like 20-hour days. We were working yeah. a lot. They'd come back in, and they'd be like, oh, my God, Pro Tools is amazing. They thought it was yeah. them. Yeah. They literally thought it was them. And that whole record went that way. And I don't know if that record was ever released, was it? I don't think so. I also I remember that the studio owner was named Hans Jurgen, which Hans Jeff and I had a, had a, like, a... <laughs> That was like the only thing that kept us going for 28 days. <laughs> hands jerking. His, his orange juice. He would make us fresh squeeze orange juice every morning. His hands were jerking. His hands jerking. Oh, God, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Ju juveniles. <laughs> Anything to get through yeah. those kinds of things. And that doesn't really exist either. That's really, you look at New York in the 90s and the early thousands, right? And it was like you were working 20 hours a day or you were working no hours a day. You were on your couch or you were buried in the studio nonstop. And nowadays, I don't really think that's the case anymore, right? Yeah. It's so separate. Well, the record gets tracked and then it goes to Mike's house. Part of it goes to the guitar player's house. Especially now, yeah. It's, it's a different, different vibe than what we were doing. Yeah. Well, the New, I mean, the New York survival thing, the more that you could actually do by yourself and not farm out, the more you could survive, the more money you could make. All right, so that's, that was your, that's what got you ready for your life. But oh, 100%. That was like, yeah. there's two versions of Jeff Copeland. There's that version, which is like, hey, I got sort of beat up and paid my dues. I would do it again, which I think is an interesting concept. Yeah. And now you, you're on your own. You've got publishing deals, you're making some good money, and now you're going out and you're saying, I'm going to be the Burmans in the equation. Yes, I 100%, at the point where I had enough success, especially in Canada, we had a couple of pop acts, Sky, remember Sky and McMaster and James, I think you mixed those records. For, yeah. Um, they were big hits and I was doing pop rock stuff, stuff that I actually right. wanted, wanted to do. And um, it was time for me to go out on my own and I always had my eyes now on Zamba and Jive. So they had, a, a back then, Zamba was, uh, a production publishing company started originally uh, by Clive Calder for, for Mutt Lang in the 80s. And it was all about, Clive had this amazing producer, songwriter, Mutt, and started a company around him. And they had this business model that was, all right, we're going to hire writers to write with you. And our writers are going to go on your songs, that, uh, your albums that you which produced. Which wasn't happening at acts, the time. Which wasn't happening at the time. And we're going to release them on our record company, now called Jive. They started their, this record company. And we're going to record them at Battery Studios, our studio that they built. So they had this in-house thing. It was a much larger version than what the Bermans were trying to do, except for they rented the studio outright. You know, So they had me and the, probably the publishing thing they had Warren. And we were, fur, you know, we were furnishing everything, and they were bringing the acts, and it was all under one big umbrella company. Um, so, and I wanted in there because they were doing, uh, you know, Backstreet Boys and Sing, Britney Spears, right. hugely successful yeah. at the time. And um, I got a call one day from uh, David Gray, who was uh, under Eric Beal at, um, at Zamba. And uh, this I is the NR guy, not the artist. Yeah, this is, the, yeah, correct. Yeah, he was creative. He was a publisher. And um, he loved the stuff that I had done with the Moffats and uh, with Sky. And um, he wanted to know what my publishing situation was. And I had just gotten out of my Warner deal. I did three years with Warner Chapel. Uh, cause, uh, and I was like, are you kidding me, Zomba? I'd love to meet you guys. <laughs> And I caught in, signed this deal, and I was like, this was, this was my dream scenario. I was in New York City. I had, with the best publishing deal where they, you know, they were looking for producer writers. And I started to work with all the acts, the new batch of acts, 
uh, underneath uh, Backstreet and Sync, like their next level of artists, all the new artists that they had signed. And for six months, it was uh, just the best friggin' scenario. And that's when I met you. Yeah. Um, I, I met Mike during this time. And um, they were also very much in the artist development world. Um, and it was a great, it was a great home for me. And of course, six months in, Clive sells the company for $3 billion to BMG. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's it. Right. They I remember share. hearing yeah. stories. I think Eric Beale yeah. told the story that they would sit at a conference table and Clive Calder would sit there with his ledger sheet and go, okay, you know, uh, Jeff Copeland is whatever, $10,000 unrecouped in his, you know, why does he not have a song on the new, which doesn't exist at all anymore. Like, yeah. you know, they would, they would feed their own, yep. feed their, which is brilliant. It's like the Motown. It's Joe like Bat the Motown yeah. thing. That's, yeah. that's UK Motown, the originator of that whole thing, 100%. Yeah. But imagine in, being in a writer the, on, like, you know, publishers don't do that anymore, but right. like they would. And when BMG took it, it probably all just went, you're BMG, BMG now. And you oh completely and and first of all they they took the big acts off artist wise off of Jive and and uh, I don't even know what happened to Jive they, they don't exist anymore right I don't think so yeah no it became didn't it become Arista well, it got folded into Arista Records I believe I think they operated for a little bit but Zamba basically got shut down and and while I was on Zamba Zamba had an office in Nashville so this is two thousand three two thousand four um, and. Uh, Mike, so another thing I learned from the Bermans um, was the whole home studio thing. Okay, so they, <laughs> you'll appreciate this, I'm sure you remember this. They had this little O2R in the lounge area, right? Which is a, a, one of the first digital boards. Yeah. Um, and we had this big SSL in the main room, which I, honestly we never used. Everything was done on this O2R in the, in the lounge. Christian would do everything on that. Um, and to the point where we would bring in a uh, head of a record company or an AR person to listen to the mixes. And he was playing it from the O2R in the lounge. And we had tie lines running in, into, so it played through the big speakers, the $50,000 speakers. Those, what were those speakers that he had? Questions. Questions. <laughs> through an SS, through this, you know, $200,000 SSL playing on a $8,000 O2R. That's actually what it was all recorded and mixed on. And the uh, a &R guy would come in and listen on these big speakers and be blown away. This is great. This is awesome. And this is where all their money was going. But meanwhile, they're doing it all on this tiny thing. So what do you need the studio for? And this is when it was just starting to get capable. So I had bought this brownstone in Brooklyn. Um, when I say bought, I was, this is another thing that I look back in retrospect and go, one of the best decisions I've ever made, just fuck it, I'm going for it. I don't care what happens, jumping without a parachute. So I got a, this is back when publishing deals were lucrative. So I got at the time a $100,000 advance from Warner Chapel on my first published deal with the Bermans. Now, at the time, that's really wasn't that much considering what, now it's, I'd love a $100,000 publishing deal. Yeah, yeah. But at the time for pop deals, that wasn't that great. But for me, I was like, oh my God, $100,000. And I was already making money at the studio enough to live. So I took that entire $100,000 and bought Pit, put 20% down on a $500,000 brownstone, not paying the taxes on it, having complete faith that next year I'll get another $100,000 advance, pay the taxes I owe, and pay the taxes for year two, oh, assuming that I get through the first year of uh, This is why people jump off bridges, <laughs> right? This is but I was like, so whatever. And to me, the 100000 was gambling money, but I wasn't gambling it. I was gambling it on my success. I'm going to do well in the next year and get another advanced and pay, and pay the taxes back. Otherwise, I'll, if I lose the house, I lose the house. I'll sell it and hopefully it'll be okay. So I did it. Next year, I got the second year advance, paid all my taxes, cut up, and then I had this brownstone. And I rented the uh, bottom two floors out. And a few years later, Mike Shimshack moves in. <laughs> Yes, I did. <laughs> and that's how I met Mike. That was Mike. a great place, man. <laughs> I, I loved Mike, it. I yeah. met Mike at yeah. your place. You took me yeah. down around to the side and Mike opens the door. Mike opens the door. There you go. That's how you guys met. So um, it was a great music house because Mike was doing music. And, and so I put a home studio upstairs mm. um, and in, one, in two of the bedrooms. And I started, I made the jump like you did. Uh, I listened to one of your podcasts where you're talking about the decision to buy the friggin' Pro Tools rig. Right. And dropping all that money on gear. Is it 
And it was expensive back then. It was then. expensive. 12 yeah. to 14 grand. Yeah. Maybe 18 if you bought a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that, that Zamba deal that I had was huge for me because the money that I was getting paid to produce a pop song was just stupid. Again, at the time, it wasn't stupid. But for me, it was stupid. <laughs> it was stupid money. Um, and... I was able to buy like that nine thousand dollar microphone and buy those those knee preamps and spend the money and I remember, invest it I back in myself. I remember you talking about yeah. that publishing deal too. That you had another option with Warner, right? And that and that you went, if I recall the conversation, Zamba was giving you less money, but you knew you'd get the production through Josh. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Warner yeah. Warner was the only reason why I was on Warner. I didn't even know anybody there. They never called me. Hmm. It was oh. it was a bank. It was all because of the Bermans. So whatever the Bermans were doing, right. they knew I was going to get a piece of. So that was what I considered a major publishing deal. It was my first experience with a major publishing deal. And then... Um, and they were just trying to keep the Bermans happy. Completely. And, and you were working, yeah, so I was, it was like, oh, we can yeah. collect some of the money for Jeff's portion of that. It made total sense. Pretty much. But no, yeah. real, no relationship or like... Nothing. They weren't invested in you. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I was just a, a number, one of many you know, numbers they looked at in a book, I'm sure. But Zamba was this family. It was this creative, all-inclusive, everybody together. We're going to give you X. Here's the studio. Go do this. Here's the budget. We need something for this. And, and it was fantastic. I, and I, I did any, anything they gave me. I had this Turkish artist. Okay, the, the, uh, uh, the guy who was running the company had a Turkish wife, and there was an artist named Tarkan who was huge in Turkey. And um, <laughs> you, you, you would get these emails saying, we're looking for a song for this movie or so-and-so for this artist. And, and I would always try to submit something for that. So I got this uh, email at, uh, at night saying, Tarkan, this international artist, Turkish, is looking for songs uh, to write to. He's looking for tracks to write to, uh, to write lyrics to for his next project. And he's the, uh, the Elvis of Turkey or the Michael Jackson of Turkey, I think is what they called it. <laughs> So uh, I was like, okay, what is Turkish music like? Um, okay, it's kind of a little bit uh, Middle Eastern. Who do I know who's Middle Eastern? Uh, my drummer, Nir. So I was like, Nir, come over, bring some instruments, some Middle Eastern instruments. And he came over with his uh, darpuka and yeah. he started playing all these different beats and I would take them and sample it and I just lay it, made a beat out of Nir's percussion playing through this and, and it's like... So I'm Jewish myself, and uh, Turkish music has a, lo a little bit of that Jewish uh, minor chord kind of thing yeah. to it. What else is kind of like that? A lot of the Latin music at the time sort of has that minor chord pop thing, like a Shakira song or a Jennifer Lopez song. So I basically did like a, 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 a Latin American, Middle Eastern kind of thing. I had no idea what this dude sounded like. I had never done Turkish pop music before. I just wanted to get it, turn it in. Spent two hours coming, playing these little chords in a piano with a little acoustic guitar with a lot of that, you know, Latin style strumming um, and send it off to them. And I, and I sang a melody that was, uh, you know, a little chanty thing. La, 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 and did it with laws and all this kind of stuff. Whoa, kind of stupid thing and threw it in. Didn't hear anything. Uh, a month later, I get an email Congratulations, your song's going to be the single. <laughs> I was like, what song? <laughs> and they're like, they're all excited about it. It's called Doo Doo. Which means what in Turkish? It, it's a D-U-D-U. -D -U. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Woohoo. Uh, it's a term mean, of you? endearment. It's like darling. Okay. But oh, I was like, doo doo. That's yeah. amazing. Um, and then I didn't hear anything. And then, uh, then they sent it to me after that. And I was blown away. I was like... You know, it's all the same melody, everything that I did, but the guy, you know, apparently wrote some good lyrics. I, I couldn't tell you what they say, but it was, and the producer did a great job on it. Um, it was sounded, a big, big hit. Sounded like a hit. This thing was, because I got a call six weeks after that. Um, it's blowing up. He, he wants to meet you. We want to fly you to Turkey. We want to fly you to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. He's doing a concert. By the time I arrived in Istanbul, it was a uh, huge number one. Wow. Uh, he opened and closed his show with it <laughs> outdoors in you know front that's of a big song when you open and close your show. With Thirty thousand people to see this guy. So I had no idea what I was, you know, uh, getting into. Landed in Istanbul, went right to the concert from the air, from the airport, exhausted, um, and it was like 
just insanity. It was my, my first experience listening to 30,000 people sing in a completely language yeah. I didn't understand. But to sing something that I'd written, that was, that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. That's amazing. So Zamba was cool like that because it opened the doors to all different kinds of music. But yeah. tell me like how that, in the current iteration of you, like when you're looking all that history yeah. and seeing it, it's like, it's kind of like, oh, this is how the world works for me, right? And you've got all the assets to do that. A lot of people don't have the assets, but you've got them. Uh, when you're doing that now, like when you put together a Love and Theft, which ended up being one of the, you know, it was a top 10 band, number one song, mm -hmm. how many, a bunch of singles probably over the years. Yeah. What is that, how does that work? You started off, I remember, because you, you had said to me, hey, I'm trying to put together like an Eagles band. Yeah, okay, so this, this, Which, this uh, how I got to that was, and that was my ticket to wanting to move to Nashville. So I'm with Zama. Kyle Pass was my first uh, artist development project that I tried to do in New York. And, and you know, I know Mike knew him well, and he was doing a lot of stuff on writing with me on that, uh, with Kyle. Um, that was my first attempt at, at doing it. Now, one thing I did not uh, take into consideration was the, the, the branding aspect. I didn't know anything about branding, what that meant <laughs> at the time. I just found this, knew this kid, thought he was super talented. We started to write together and I wanted to make a record on him and I wanted to try to get him a record deal. And, and watching the Bermans is you put an act together and you bring somebody in and they sign it, right? That's how it works. <laughs> this is with Kyle Pass. This is with Kyle Pass. So I'm in New York. Meanwhile, I'm taking trips to Nashville, doing some writing because Zamba had an office down here. So I started to get a little taste of Nashville. I'm developing this guy, Kyle, and I made what I thought was a great record. Uh, and everybody that I played it for thought it was a great record. And it's really good. And this was the, the days of MySpace. Um, was really big. And a lot of acts, a lot of A&R people were looking towards MySpace as a barometer. Now it's commonplace. If your socials aren't happening, you're not getting signed. I mean, you have to have some sort of online presence. So MySpace sort of started that whole thing. And Kyle, uh, he wasn't touring. He was just a guy that lived in Nashville and that we were making music. So we were in the factory making it. Went out, had some meetings. Love this record. It's a great record. Kyle's great. Kyle's fantastic. Uh, how many independent records have you sold? How many MySpace friends do you have? That's what they cared about. Um, and so I was like, well, nothing. And so there's no development going on right now. Like you, you haven't, I was like, isn't that what you guys are supposed we to do? We thought you did that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that your job Am to, I getting punked yeah, here? Isn't that your job? <laughs> so uh, David Gray at this point was now working for Dave Massey at Epic. And I had a meeting with him about Kyle and he's like, dude, you know, I love this. I love this. It's great. But he's just another solo male. What makes him different? Yes, the record's great. The songs are great. But what's the story? What's the, you know, there's nothing mm -hmm. unique about him right now. There's a hundred other people doing the same thing. What's your brand? I was like, oh, my what? <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about that. Um, and Kyle wasn't out doing his thing. You know, like at most successful rock acts, go out on the road, build it organically, build a following, and then you make the jump to getting a deal. Um, the artist development world is different because you can't really do that. You're putting something together, you're manufacturing something or finding something, you're trying to fast track, you're trying to skip all that whole step, all the hard work, all the grinding, all the organic, the foundation to the pyramid that you're trying to build, you're skipping that. Uh, and, and it's usually hit or miss because if you do happen to get a deal for them, you're throwing it out there, but there's no foundation. Of, if you don't have a hit right away, there's nothing. So all this work that I did with Kyle, I had a great record, but then what, what happens? If nobody wants to sign him right away, right. what's my next step? There is no next step. Right. Unless he's going to go out on his own and do it. Now it's a different world. Now it's a great time to be an independent act. You actually can release your music right. without a record company. Yeah. But at the time, the gatekeepers were it. So I was like, I learned a valuable lesson. I was like, okay, you could have all the great music you want in the world, but if there's, unless you're buddies with the head of a label and they're going to do it because, you know, they love you. But in the same conversation that David Gray was telling me, I, I can't do anything with this. He's just another solo male. He's like, but you know what I have been looking for? I've been looking for kind of like a, uh, a, a new Eagles. Do you have anything like that? I was like, no, but I'll put one together. And because uh, so he was excited about that as a brand because there's nothing like that. He's like, there hasn't been anything like that. 
I think that that's something that I could definitely work with that, that has a brand, would be unique. I was like, I'll, I'll totally, I'll put it together for you. So um, Love and Theft was originally conceived by David Gray <laughs> in his office saying he's looking for something like the Eagles. And it was, yeah. uh, there was three guys. Well, originally we were trying to do four. So at, the, at this time, I've been taking trips down to Nashville and one of my favorite co-writers down here was Robert Ellis Oral. And he sort of adopted me into his family. I would stay at his house. Uh, we wrote great songs together. Uh, he was helping me write a lot of stuff that I was doing for Zamba. He was deeply into a lot of the acts that I was, and the records that I was doing, a lot of the co-writes I did were, were with him. So I told him what David Gray said about uh, the Eagles. And I was like, dude, I want to do this. I want to try to put it together. I want to find the guys in Nashville. I wasn't living in the, here at the time. I was in New York. So I was like, can you help me? Will you, you want to be my partner on this? And Bob was already a successful, he had an artist career here. He was a successful writer. He was a producer here. So he was deeply in Nashville, well-respected. So I was like, let's do it together. And I didn't, and again, I didn't know at the time um, the whole outsider thing with Nashville. So it ended up working great because I had Bob yeah, yeah. as a ticket in. At the time, I didn't uh, know how outsiders were treated in Nashville. Were you already living here? I think I was. Okay. Yeah, I've just, but fairly new, brand new. Did you experience some resistance coming from New York? They would say Yankee a lot to your face. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and they would do it in that Nashville way where they're yeah. super sweet, but you know, you kissed. Bless you your heart. the idea that you weren't supposed to sit with them. You know, and nice. So I, I, was, I was fortunate that, and I didn't realize at the time, Bob was kind of my in to Nashville. Um, and I was working on something for New York. Um, and a lot of the Nashville writers wanted to be a part of it because it was going to be for New York. I was going to put this group together down here and get them ready and then bring them and just showcase them for Dave Massey and David Gray and also some other labels. Because the Eagles, you know, what were the Eagles back then? Now they'd be considered pop, rock, country, no, whatever. No, they'd be country. Yeah. They release yeah. to country yeah. radio when they release. Right. Now they, now they would be country. Right. Um, so we I put, would argue that you couldn't even get the old Eagles songs on country radio right now because they're too country. <laughs> like Take It Easy. <laughs> That's funny. The banjo. It's got the, a banjo. You got yeah, yeah, to get, get the banjo out. Get the banjo out. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I, I took my pop experience of, of developing acts to Nashville. So this was something that Bob, Bob had done artist development here also. Um, and I found out that that was a little bit shunned upon in Nashville at the time. There wasn't, it wasn't as, as, uh, as accepted as it is in pop. Pop, you put something together, you own it. Yeah. Because you put it together, you're doing everything. You're auditioning people for this, uh, for this company that you're making. So you're technically the CEO. And they get percentages and you pay them, but it's your brand, it's your brand, it's your thing. You're creating it. So I took, after talking to Bob, he's like, we don't do that here at all. <laughs> it's like, well, then how do you protect yourself? So a normal yeah. deal, so yeah. people know, a normal deal, production deal used to be you'd split the four revenues. You know, you have record royalties, you have publishing, you have touring, and you have merchandise. In a New York City the production company would take 50% of all of those. So every dollar that came in from any of the streams of income with a standard production deal from New York, half the money went to the production, mm -hmm. to the producer. Mm -hmm. Nashville was not so hip on that. No. <laughs> uh, so did your, but let's say, so your deal didn't go through with David Gray, obviously. Okay, so so well, yeah. you were then shopping it. This is a byproduct of you shopping in Nashville. Getting a deal in Nashville, this is, was by accident. So we had put the group together and we were looking for four guys. We ended up settling on three. And it was just acoustic, three guys playing acoustic, good looking dudes, um, all born the same year, just worked out that way. Everything was three part harmony based. And they were, it was great. I mean, the songs back then may not have been the greatest, but they were great. I mean, we just, the whole thing, they would walk into a, a room and play for you and you'd be like, this is awesome. Um, I was ready to bring them up to New York and play in an office. And, and if you've never performed in an office scenario before, showcase just you and your guitar. It's freaking terrifying if you're, if you're an artist. I mean, yeah. And the acoustics are rough, man. Oh, it's, it's so it's, dry. It's awful. It's super, super weird energy. Yeah. yeah, you have to walk in as close as we are and 
sit there. You don't know if you're gonna have to stand or sit in the couch and you have to play. And they're just staring at you, uh, not at all yeah. what, you, what you're used to. So I was like, listen, if we're gonna do this, we gotta practice an office uh, showcase scenario. You, I can't just throw you in there. You're not even gonna know where to put your eyes. Um, so we set up these practice office showcases. We called, uh, I was an ASCAP writer, so I called ASCAP. Hey, can we come play for your morning meeting or something like that? And uh, Bob knew somebody at CMA, so we did CMA, uh, not CMA, uh, CAA, the agency. So mm -hmm. we did the CAA's morning meeting, and then we did ASCAP's morning meeting as a practice. And this is another wonderful thing I learned, again, totally by accident. We go to, see, we go to uh, ASCAP, play for the morning meeting, and as soon as it's over, they get on the phone and they start calling the presidents of the labels in Nashville and they're like, we just heard the greatest friggin' band. You gotta come check these out. You gotta get these guys into your office this week while they're here. And they were calling everybody that they knew. And I was like, well, wait, well, we're going to New York to, <laughs> but this will be good practice, guys. It'll be good practice to go do like an actual label showcase. So the lesson that I learned from there was, and that's how we, we got a record deal like four days after that, <laughs> just from, from, from. But did David there. Gray actually say, no, not interested? Or was it just it a never made it to It never made it to New York. Oh, and, and, and I'll tell you why, because um, they were so excited about it uh, and they were excited about developing it. And I this just. This was Disney the, that signed it, right? This was Lyric Street, okay, Doug Disney. Howard. But that's a. Uh, which was a Disney owned yeah. label. But they were super excited about um, developing it, as in doing all the work, the promotion stuff, and putting them out on a radio tour and, and getting them out there. And now, was there any fear on your part that they were going to be like, hey, we've got Rascal Flats. We want to get this 100%. band and take them and stow them away somewhere so that they don't. 100%. Step on a Rascal Flats market. Um, I love Stephen Barker Lyles. He's <laughs> one of the early, that boy's got balls and he speaks his mind. That one of the early things we were playing for Doug, actually at the showcase, we walk in, in Doug's office, we were playing and Doug's like, this, this is great, this is great. Um, man, the elephant in the room though, the elephant in the room. Rascal Flats, I don't know what we're gonna do. But man, I love you guys. This is great. Um, and Steven goes, yeah, but those guys are old. <laughs> <laughs> and then Doug, if you know Doug, Doug's like, love Doug to death. But he'll like, he'll, he'll t speak his mind if you offend him. And he looked up and he's like, <laughs> I like you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I was waiting for him to go, get the fuck out of my office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, That's amazing. Um, uh, yeah, so they started another label. <laughs> they started Carolwood Records uh, and just basically oh, got wow. another promotion team just to, because Rascal Flats at the time were the act. I mean, they were friggin' huge. So they wanted to, uh, to expand to get to have Love and Theft. And it was between Sony and here's another thing. The thing that I learned, by the way, that I was talking about was it was almost like if you want to get to the head of a label, you could call up the head of a label yourself and go, hey, I got this great act I want you to hear. Uh, that's not going to be as effective as if his minions around him, the people that work underneath him, come to him and say, I got, you got to hear this act. And then they'll come to you. So I learned that, and, I've, and ever since then, I try to let, I try to create the buzz through the people, through the lower layers of the people. Go to them, let them talk it up. That's way more powerful than mm. if you try to make that power phone call and get that meaning. Because right. um, they got us the record deal. We weren't even looking for it. Just the fact that we did that rehearsal and they picked up the phones and hyped everybody on it. It was easy after that. I don't have to do anything. So yeah. you did the, the first uh, Love and Theft record that had the big hit on it? Did the first record. Um, we had a, a, a top 10, number nine, uh, Runaway was the single, uh, Out of the Box. Things were going great. They were, they were on Taylor Swift's headline, uh, first direct support to her first big tour that she was on. Wow. Um, second single was out, climbing the charts. It was at number 25. And Disney decided that, you know what, this little label that we have here in Nashville, uh, what is this? How much? Uh, psh, close it. 
new president came in and, oh, wow. and shut down Lyric Street oh, boy. from L.A., not even knowing anything about it. So when it. was Angel Eyes the number one? Is that a different record? Yes. So, oh. so now there were, there, there were three guys in Love of Theft at the time without a record deal. Um, so they're out of a record deal after record they're, one. They're out of a record deal, record one. This is going to make sense in a second, but I want to backtrack to the, the two labels that were fighting over them. We had Lyric Street with Doug Howard, and then we had uh, the last Joe Galani era of Sony. Caroline Mobley was there and Jim Catino, and uh, they wanted them too. But this is at the time where Sony was very much, you know, we have our machine, we have our writers that we like, and we have our producers. They weren't interested in Bob and, Bob and myself. Uh, oh, interesting. Doug was all about what we were doing as a production company. Um, but we also liked Doug. He loved the vision. He loved the, as it was. He just wanted us to make a great record. Well, they were like, we're going to get you with so-and-so, and then we're going to start working you that way. Um, and the guys, you know, the guys were, we all collectively wanted to go with Lyric Street. It felt right. We'd still be able to be involved. Um, so that's the route that we went. Now, when they lost, Lyric Street went out of business. I went to Catino at Sony, and I was like, this is at the time where I had a, my second development act, the Luna Bells, which was a group of girls that I got signed to Sony with Jim Catino. Um, Jim was not head of A&R at that time. Uh, this is when he was uh, one of the junior A&R people. So he was one of the people that I befriended and brought in to hype it up, and he championed that project all the way into getting signed. Um, so I already had a relationship with Jim, and the Luna Bells were on Sony, and Love and Theft needed a record deal. So I um, brought him over there, and they signed them. But they wanted to, at that point, <clears throat> the guys and I sort of went through uh, a bit of it. Once they got their team together, manager, you know, when you, when you develop acts, uh, and then you actually, they actually become successful and they build their team. At the beginning, it's just you and them. You're doing all the creative stuff. You're like their manager. You're their uh, marketer. You're, doing, you're their promotion guy. You're doing everything for them. You're their producer. You're their songwriting mentor. You're all these things for them. And then they go and they get a record deal and then they get a manager and they get a lawyer and they get a record company and they get all these people that all need to make money off of them, and, and it's not uncommon where they're like, who are these guys, why are they here? Right. Uh, <laughs> and this was a classic case of that. And the poor guys were caught up in a whirlwind of early success, so they were gone. And then their, their uh, lawyer was like, well, we'll, we'll, take care of, uh, we'll take care of these guys. You guys go out and do your thing, trust us, we're gonna renegotiate your deal. And the deal that we had with them was way, way, way fairer than any of the New York deals. Like I came and I, I consulted with Bob beforehand and came up with a deal that I thought was very fair and made a lot of sense um, so that they could continue and flourish and not have to even use us as producers if they didn't want to. You know, the, the, when you develop acts, you don't want your relationship with them to be dependent upon it. You, you, want, you want them to want to work with you, but you also want to give them the freedom to be able to branch out and and feel like they're not going to screw you if they do that. <laughs> right. You, know, That's you, don't, good point. you, you don't want to hold them back, but you also, also want to protect yourself and maintain some kind of ownership. So there's all kinds of deals you could do, but we came out with what I thought was a, was a very fair deal. Um, and as soon as they went off on the road and started having success, their lawyer came back to renegotiate that deal. And that turned into a year plus battle um, with us and her because she was being ridiculous. And in the end, uh, we got together with the guys and made a, a very quick settlement without her. And they got left with a massive bill from her. <laughs> um, and things were fine, but we went through a rough period. Uh, honestly. You know, what's the point in having a contract if you have to enforce it, you ruin the relationship, which means that you can't do any further business, right? I mean, isn't that a little bit ironic that it's like, we're going to agree to this, and then one, inevitably one person does the wrong thing, right? I mean, you could be mad about the wrong thing, but at the end of the day, if you're going to battle with someone for a year, there's no way you're going to be making records and nope. making, writing songs with those guys. No. Nope. Well, they were out, you know, they're out working their thing and doing their thing, and we weren't writing or doing anything with them. So they had no new music. So how did um, your song become their single? So got a new deal with Sony. They had to take some time off just to get a new deal. Brian left at this point. They became a duo. Uh, and Sony put them with 
Josh Leo to produce. And I didn't want to get in the way at this point. I was just like, if you take this deal, you're lucky to get another deal, <laughs> period. <Right. laughs> um, they didn't have that big foundation of touring and a massive following. You know, they, they had some radio success, but they're one of those acts at that time that could have fallen off the planet and nobody would have cared. Um, they were just starting to scratch the surface. They had one hit, start of another. They were on a, one big tour, but they weren't out touring, touring. They were out and, you know, spending record company money in a big-ass tour yeah. bus and, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, so, second record, they got their new deal. They needed music quickly. And at this point, I was allowed to write with them once. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's just the way it worked out. They were off and free doing all their and were things. Were you guys, like, when you saw each other, you were glad to see each other? Was it weird? Yeah, it, it was, uh, at, at this point, it was, it, was, it was a lot better. We had rec yeah. reconciled, and I've always loved those guys. I mean, it's nothing against them. It's more about the team that they build, and, and um, I don't blame them for listening to their lawyer or their manager who are, you know, were no longer with them after that. <laughs> When they got with Sony and they got new management, new lawyer, new everything. It got better. It, it, it got better. And so we got together in a row and we wrote Angel Eyes the one time I got to write with them. So we didn't produce their second album and that was their lead single, um, number one song. They were back with a you know, big, big hit and uh, that was it. <laughs> that was the last time I got to, last, pretty much the last time for a while. Uh, I know you had a softball team with him because you asked me to play. Oh, yeah. And they were like, are you good? I'm like, oh, dude, I kill. And then <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to be nuking bombs over the, you know, the fence. It's going to be great. And I went down to this field in uh, <laughs> East Nashville, and I was like 40-something. And I was, my brain was still 22. And I can remember... I was, it was a doubleheader. It was so bad that they benched me halfway through the first game. Oh, and I was dude. grateful. My ankles felt like powder. Like I ground them into one of those, one of those things you see at the, yeah, yeah. the, at the uh, drugstore. And it was just like... <laughs> but I remember this was, uh, this was the Love and Theft softball team. Yeah, we called the Theft Heads because that's what their fans were called. Now, this team had some serious talent on it. So this was... You know, uh, I, I moved to East Nashville when I moved here. And... Um, Everybody was in this little little community. So our softball team consisted of uh, Eric and Stephen and Brian from Love and Theft. It consisted of Rob Blackledge that uh, became part of Blackjack Belly with me. Um, Tyler Hubbard from Florida Georgia Line. Kanan Smith, uh, who be he became an artist and a big writer. Um, who else was on that team? Sky Joe team. West. Joe West. For two games. <laughs> uh, there were a couple of the guys that ended up becoming big riders. You know, we were all just, they were all um, either parking cars or doing landscaping at, at the time. And Tyler um, started touring a lot with FGL before they had their deal. Um, and so he played one, he played a season with us, but then he was out on the road. And I was watching, I learned a lot from him and BK they went out and they did it the rock way. They went out and they just toured and they toured and they toured before they got their big break with Cruz, before they had their big hit. And I saw what happened to Love and Theft um, as far as you could have a radio hit, right? Um, and then after that, they had, they had a failed single and another failed single. And then they were pretty much falling off the cliff at that point. Mm. As far as trajectory, they had nothing to, they had a number one and couldn't l turn it into anything because they didn't have the fan base. They didn't have anything mm. built up to it uh, right around that time. And then I had the Luna Bells, which was a group of sisters uh, that I um, knew from New York days that moved to Nashville, uh, put them with uh, their three sisters, put them with a fourth, uh, Alex Klein, who's now uh, on her way up as a producer writer, um, got him a deal with Sony. And they just self-combusted as soon as they got into the A and R phase. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's got to be tough this, too, because yeah. like Mike's, you know, he's got the OTO thing he's doing, and yeah. in the back of my mind, I'm always nervous for my friends that are doing this because at any moment you could be perfect. It's not you for the faint of heart, <laughs> no. Yeah. And they could go yeah. run amok. They could go out one night and get into an argument at a bar, and the band is over. Yeah. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. That of course. stresses me out, man. Or they could become successful and they could be like, all right, we're going to go work with... Uh, yeah, not you. Not you. <laughs> right. Yeah. right now. Thank you so much for yeah. everything that you've done. Or you done. could build a massive following on TikTok and the president decides to... To, uh, to shut it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> so would so. you... Would you 
are you actively developing things right now? Is it something that yeah. you're like, okay, I'm just going to keep on doing this because it's been successful for me? Yes. So, well, this is going to lead into Blackjack Billy. So, Luna Bell's big record deal, you know, they completely, as soon as they got control of, of the bus, took the wheel of the bus, they friggin' drove it off the cliff. They were friggin' <laughs> difficult. They were arguing with... Uh, the middle sister was arguing with uh, smash hit songwriters that we brought in. You know, like when you're in the room and you're just... You have no business doing anything but listening and learning. It should be a master class for you. Not, you're not, you shouldn't be arguing with a guy that's had 30 number one songs. Um, you know, this is your time to learn. Uh, she would, and they would argue with the a and people about songs to cut and all this stuff. And, and they, yeah. So they got dropped halfway through the radio tour of the first single. <laughs> Jeez, uh, they a, just, they were pissing. Not a good side. Just, yeah. And again, so this is something that you spend a year, year and a half of your time on. And, and then they gone. get out there and then you're, it's out of your hands. Uh, and they had, again, they weren't touring. They had no following. So as soon as they lost their deal, they all split up, moved on, and left town. That was it. A year and a half of my life wasted. Wow. Meantime, um, through all these people, I see FGL out on the road doing it, building a following, and they hit with crews and friggin' blow up, um, but they had the foundation to turn that into the smash that it was because they already had a big thing around them. Mm-hmm. And then Big Machine came in as, you know, they put that out independently. Uh, the Highway started playing it right. when, back when they were playing independent music. Yeah, for a minute there, uh, if you can get on XM Radio, yeah, you could be a... You could be a thing. You could be a thing. So I started Rob Blackledge and Noel Billings. I, I wanted to put together uh, my third thing at this point. You know, the Luna Bells were, hadn't gotten dropped yet. So I had Love and Theft and Luna Bells on Sony, and I was ready to do another one. <laughs> Uh, and I met Noel through my publisher, EMI, and um, we started writing together, and I had known Rob Blackledge through uh, Love and Theft, and I thought that they should get together uh, and start working together. I thought they'd be good together, and I was going to do either a duo or a group around them. I wasn't quite sure. Uh, so Blackledge and Billings became Blackjack Billy, and I named them Blackjack Billy, and I started writing with the three of them. And um, Noel and I just connected so well as writers, and we got a band together and we couldn't find a guitar player. So I was like, I'll just, I'll start showcasing with you. We're just playing shows. And, and, uh, how many years later? <laughs> I still wasn't going to do it. And they were like, let's just make it a band at the time, you know, back to the branding. So, you know, the Luna Bells were the country go go's. They were all playing four girls, drummer, everything, you know, and there was nothing like that. There were female vocal groups, but none that it was actually a band. Uh, Love and Theft was going to be the country Eagles. I wanted to make the country Aerosmith. You know, there's a lot of bands, but there's just not, there weren't a lot of bands at the time. There were a couple, but no bands with like a star lead singer, like, you know, with a Robert Plant and a Jimmy Page or a Joe Perry and a Steven Tyler, you know, that classic thing. So uh, Noel was that front man. Uh, and I wanted to do this and I wanted them. I was like, Tyler and BK went out and friggin' toured their asses off did it independently and broke that way. I'd just gone through two quick skip the line right to the record company deals with no foundation. And if things don't go well, they're over, they're done. So right. let's build this like a rock thing. Go out on the road. And they started to. And uh, we had a couple of different guitar players at the time early on. And I would go out and I freaking loved it. <laughs> so I was at that point, this is 2013, 12. Okay, I was 43 years old at the time. I hadn't been in a band since I moved to New York City in 1990. Um, I was like, this is incredible. And, and I just, to, 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 to have that experience of being in the trenches with an artist at the beginning, so I always loved that creative thing, which is why I kept trying to make bands. If I couldn't be in one, I wanted to make them. Now I was like in the trenches, trying out songs, writing them, going out and playing them in dirty clubs and seeing how they work and getting that experience that you can't get from being in the studio. You can't send, like, I could not have identified with what Love and Theft was going through at the beginning when they were out on the road. Uh, you know, all the traveling to hotels and not making any money and eating shitty f- fast food. And although they had a nice bus, thanks to Lyric Street. But, you know, you can't, being away from your family, you can't really know what that's like unless you're doing it. And I started to get that. And I was like, this is a great perspective. And I, and I, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I never thought I'd have an opportunity to 
do this at 43 years old? Who the fuck wants to start a band at 43? And they were like, dude, just be in the band, just be in the band. You're great, you don't worry about it. You look 25. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, so I officially joined the band and we followed the FGL route to the T. We went out, toured our asses off. Uh, and being a producer and a writer, I was able to make really good sounding recordings. So I was now an artist. Uh, and I was tired of getting fucked by uh, acts, honestly. <laughs> you know, the, talk about a, a way to be able to control your investment. Be the <laughs> artist. <laughs> and this, this was the time when, you know, you can't, you're not selling records anymore. All the money's in touring and merch. And the only way to be an artist developer, if you're not getting a piece of that, like labels are, it's all 360 stuff. If you're not getting some sort of piece of that, you're not making any money. Right. So who cares if you wrote the song and who cares if, if, if you produced it? That's not where the long-term money is. That's not, that's not the, you know, the real money uh, that's, that pays for the investment and the amount of time it is. Be part of the act. Or even, even if you're a manager and you're making that type of percentage, they could drop you in a second. Right. You can't So how long did you band. end up being with that band? So we, uh, 2013, we had a song called The Booze Cruise that The Highway started playing. And um, it blew up virally. This was a great time for uh, TuneCore and independent acts. So people were starting to use TuneCore a lot. We had our, our song on Tune, TuneCore. Because of the highway, uh, it, it blew up and it sold 250,000 copies wow. in, in the States without, oh, wow. without a record deal. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, so digital stuff was flying. This was pre-streaming, right before streaming really picked up. So people were buying the downloads. And so you could buy yourself without a record deal, put a song on TuneCore, and somebody could download it. Wow. Uh, and that's what happened. Because of the highway, we had the exposure, and we, had, we made a video that blew up on uh, YouTube. So we, got a, we, got, we were on the forefront of this whole independent act, no record deal. And, and that year, you know, we were... We freaking charted in Billboard. That's uh, amazing. We, had, we were number 39. We had no radio play. Huh. Just on sales. Wow. Heat seekers, yeah. Uh, but it, it charted in the Billboard top 40. Well, what do they call that? The regional... It's the country charts. Okay. Yeah, because where they take sales and airplay. Yes, so we yes. had the highway. So we were on the radio. So we counted. But our sales were so strong, we actually showed up at number 39 uh, <laughs> for a week. <laughs> uh, and then we got a deal with Bigger Picture. So here I was, you know, got this record deal. I was in the band and um, made the mistake of then starting to chase radio and try to write the single. And that uh, ended up being a friggin'... That's another story for another podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we, we're yeah. running over here, so we're gonna, yeah. we have to pull a plug, but we got to have you back on to hear the rest of the story. It's like, yeah. um, it's like the Forrest Gump story, or we just watched Joe Dirt, not the, <laughs> no reference to you Joe Dirt, but De oh, Dennis Dirt. is the radio yeah. guy. He brings him back like multiple days that week. Yeah. Uh, we got to hear more about this, and I'd love to hear how it wraps up into like what your philosophy is for like how you spend your time going forward and what it is you want to do. Because you seem like your career, you've been learning at every step. Oh, yeah. Now like, I'm, sort of like, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to make that mistake again. And it's like this I, pathway I, to where you need to be. I think we're all still doing music because we love it. And, and that's why I've been doing it so long. And you guys are still doing it because you love it and you're a glutton for punishment. Uh, I'm doing another artist development project now. Are you right? <laughs> are you? I'm, I'm going back in it. It's like, fuck it. I, I'm ready. You know, but you learn from each one. Uh, so I'm going to take all that knowledge into this one and hope that it, it flies this time. Do you have a website or something where people could be pointed toward you? Uh, Facebook, Instagram. Instagram, <laughs> Instagram Jeff someone? Copeland, J-E-F-F-C-O-P-L-A-N. All right, it, yeah. that's it, just Jeff Copeland? All right. Well, easy, thank easy. you, buddy. It's great getting to reminisce with you. We don't get Dude. to see each other enough. You're out on the road so much and yes. we're all so busy. But it was great to hear the, that whole story. There's a lot of things in there I didn't, hadn't put together. Um, so... Thank you all for listening. Um, we're going to be, um, make sure once again that you subscribe and like and, and share the podcast. We appreciate you. From the West Barn, we're signing off with Mike Shimshak and thank you, Jeff Copeland.